Welcome SF Live. We are on the road. I'm Kai Hoffman. I'm the at JR Mining Guy on Twitter and the CEO of the SOAR Financial Group. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a real educational informational interview lined up for you today. A bit different than our regular conversations about the market and the economies, US dollar, Fed, Fed fund rate policies and all that good stuff. Uh, we got Neil Ringdahl joining us here today and you can already see him, see him on screen. He's a mining engineer and he runs a mine in Honduras. It's a silver zinc mine or zinc silver because it's primarily zinc. And uh, we're getting some hands on like commentary from what is happening on the ground. And uh, Neil, first of all, welcome on the program. It's good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Yeah, no, great pleasure to have you on, Neil. Um, you're, you're a mining engineer, and as I said, you, you run a mine down in Honduras. And we got started talking about, uh, or we reconnected more or less, like we've, we've known each other where we've been, I don't know, Twitter friends, I guess, for, for a few years now. And uh, we, we've chatted again over electrifying mining fleets, right? And that sort of got the ball rolling. That's why it's like, oh, we got to chat. Like, it's, I don't think I've ever had a mining engineer who's running a mine sort of on the program. But um, getting my head of myself, Neil, why don't you introduce yourself real quick and we get to the electrification part in a minute. Yes, Ryan. Um, yeah, so I'm a mining engineer, South African, born and bred. Um, I've been building and operating mines most of my life. Also spent some time consulting as well. Um, most of my experience has been in Africa and Latin America. Um, but I've also worked in Europe and uh, done a bit of consulting into the U.S., Business Americas and Australia. And more recently, you know, I worked for a number of public companies as a CEO and COO. And uh, more recently, I was the CEO of a company called Ascendant Resources. And in 2020, uh, we were going through a bit of a grind, as most people were, with the big downturn in the, in the base metal prices um, here in Honduras. Running a El Machito zinc mine. Um, we had the option to acquire the mine through a management buyout, which we did. And we acquired a lot of debt in the process, about $30 million of debt. And it's been a real struggle since that, getting things, uh, you know, getting things back on track. But slowly we've been able to mine ourselves out of a very deep, deep corner. And we're doing very well now. Interesting. Congratulations on that. And uh, why don't we start there, actually, like challenges as a mining operator? I think that's a really interesting topic that uh, people tend to forget because everybody looks at the quarterlies, but they don't look at the challenges that sort of lie, lie behind or below or that come with it. Right. Like it, it drives me insane but... when I read some commentary online and I, I do a lot of side visits. I've been to a few mines and I know what the CEOs or even the COOs say, but they, they can't really relay or sort of communicate many of much of it so i'm really curious like neil how, how was it operating the last 18 months 24 months and what what has changed well in in 2020 we had the pandemic COVID crisis as you all know and a lot of mines were under pressure internally and externally to shut down we weren't one well we were under a lot of pressure uh, to shut down, and, and we just weren't in a position to do that. Uh, you know, our mine employs 1,200 people and benefits directly about 50,000 people here in Honduras. We, you know, this little mine generates about 2% of the GDP of Honduras. Okay. And so shutting a mine like this down is no small thing. And uh, we had a lot of fighting to do with the authorities and, uh, and convincing to do with our own people to trying to keep the doors open. Um, one of the challenges this particular mine has, for example, is that uh, it has a lot of water. We pump about 28 tons of water for every ton of ore we mine, and we do you know, 70,000 tons of ore a month. So uh, if you stop the pumps, then the mine floods, and you can't get back in there again. You could drain the water again, but you've lost your fleet or your electrics. You have to resupport everything basically a game over situation. So we weren't in a position to shut the mine down, go into care and maintenance like many, many mines do. Uh, so we, we literally had to ask the people to come in, those who were uh, who were afraid to please come in and work. Uh, and thankfully, you know, people here are very supportive, we have a very good workforce. And we had about 40% attendance uh, over the period of time. Some people were sick. People were just not, not willing to work. Um, but we survived. So that was the first thing, I guess, uh, and the biggest thing that 
and if, not to mention the usual challenges of low metal prices and increasing costs. That's become much more much more of a thing lately. Everyone's talking about inflation. Uh, you know, the supply chain's also been uh, very badly disrupted. Uh, you know, we're living in Honduras. We're fairly close to the U.S., so it's relatively easy to get stuff here. But, uh, you know, we're finding, you know, we order supplies and some suppliers, they had their problems. They've been shut down too. And so they're behind or uh, they can't get a boat to ship the materials that you need. And so we've got orders that we paid for, you know, but we're still waiting to receive eight months later. So that has a huge impact on the financial viability of the mining business, right? And that's stuff that most investors don't get to see. Uh, those are some of the, I guess, external factors. Internal factors really based mind to mind. I talked about the flooding, all the flooding risk that we got. Um, and uh, but you know, each mine has its own has its own challenge. And uh, you know, it may be a grade thing, it may be an all body shape thing, it could be a workforce thing, it could be uh, it could be a community thing. These are all things that have to be managed, and they're all balls in the air. And with you know the Big, you know, everything going green. Everyone's talking greenness, and you know, good social corporate governance, and and, uh, and that's all great. But you still have a mine to run, and I think a lot of people forgot about the technical challenges of running a mine. Without all those additional issues, it's it's very very heavy on a management team, any management team to be able to produce and then also deal with all these other you know, compliance things. And and uh, additional operations. Neil, were those challenges for you transitory? Like, have they sort of ebbed and flowed, and like, or have they disappeared? Have they been replaced by other challenges right now? Like, because we seem to be at the tail end of the COVID crisis, if you bar China yeah. from the discussion. But uh, yeah. like, how is that looking on the ground? Well, now of course, for you? I mean, COVID is no longer an issue, right? Um, but but now we're dealing with uh, you know uh, downward pressure on base metal prices. And, and a precious metals to an extent, um, you know. Uh, everyone's saying, "Yeah, it's tough," and it is tough. Uh, but the thing is, you know, you've got cost increases, and if you're a if you're a mine in a developing country that's uh, you know got a uh, you know got a local currency that's not pegged against the dollar, that's actually a good place to be because you've got inflation going up, and uh, and so you're seeing uh, you're seeing you know you know. Currency is being devalued against the US dollar, which means the costs in the of all those mines actually going down uh, against the revenue side of the equation, which you know normally metals are sold in dollars. So, so that's good. But if you're a mine like in Honduras, for example, we our currency is pegged to the dollar, so we see we see costs going up with inflation. <laughs> okay, and so power is a big issue. Uh, more recently, I'd say. You know, we were looking at mines and things in Europe, but I think with the increase in power in Europe, power costs in Europe make mining a lot more difficult, okay, uh, and uh, much more expensive. And so all those models that, you know, we looked at back in 2020 and even 2021, all those PEAs and feasibility studies, great, but do they take into account additional power costs? And what percentage of of the total cost is power? And that's just one, one thing that we're looking at. As we know, it's going up. So, now, it's like in, yeah, in terms of innovation, I think that's an interesting one because when costs go up, companies or people tend to innovate or come up with new solutions. Do you, do you see anything right. coming up there? You're on the ground. I, I obviously don't attend the technical conferences or even the technical side of PDAC, for example, where discuss, innovations are being discussed and things like. Do you see anything coming up there? Well, it depends if you want to be part of the feel-good crowd. <laughs> Uh, or not. Um, I'm not saying there, sh there is no innovation. Of course, there is innovation in mining, but mining is still a very, very basic thing. It's a primary industry. You, it's a logistics industry. It's all about moving a ton of rock, breaking it first of all to be able to move it, and then moving it from A to B to get processed, and then take the product and then sell that on. Uh, and so it's all about the cost of doing that. Uh, so cost of moving. Material. That's really what it comes down to. So, how do you how do you reduce the cost of doing that? Well, it's kind of hard if you think about it. I mean, people have looked at non-explosive methods over the years. I mean, I think back to when I first started out with Anglo-American. Um, you know, we were looking at narrow reef uh, 
mining in South Africa, and they were looking at mining a reef that was only, you know, one foot wide, um, that was running 12 gram a ton, okay? But to mine that, you have to mine over, a you know, one meter. And so, so you're looking at 66% dilution. And so if you can get that one foot out in a way that uh, doesn't dilute, great. And so a lot of smart people have looked at things like this over the years. And uh, what we came up with, and all new graduates had to go and do this, was to go and look at diamond wire cutting. So you know how they cut big granite blocks and quarries for, uh, you know, for, for uh, dimension stone. Um, using diamond wires, you wrap a, you know, they mine it, they mine it, uh, you know, a series of tunnels around a block, okay, and then you wrap a diamond wire rope on that, and you can just literally cut that, cut the top and the bottom of contact. That was the idea. But actually doing it in practice is really hard to do, you know, especially when you're working at 3,000 meters of the surface and you've got all kinds of, uh, you know, rock stresses and, and challenges like that you know, in an acid environment. And so we were able to get it right. We were able to produce the, the goal, uh, and we actually did it. It was really amazing to see these slabs come out and, you know, had a lot of secondary blasting problems and that. But unfortunately, we just were not able to mine it at a rate that was that was uh, economic, okay? And the costs were also very high as a result. You know, as soon as your production rate drops and your costs, your costs are fixed, Obviously, it just you know you get to some point where it just doesn't make sense. And unfortunately, a lot of the a lot of the innovations uh, have gone that way. But there have been some good advances. I mean, uh, you know, some of them are already very old. I've spoken about electric. I guess we want to talk about electric trucks and yeah, electric. No, uh, I was going to lead the, the conversation there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so so you know, forty years ago. Uh, people were looking at how can we how can we reduce our costs, our power costs, and you've got to think back to that. You know what is it? That one of the major major contributing you know you've got labor, you've got power, materials, and so if you look at power, you know people have been looking at that for years, and and if we go back you know a hundred years uh, where everything was manual, it was all jack leg drilling and and handheld lashing. Using mules, <laughs> uh, you know, and we started getting, uh, you know, little locomotives underground, and then with inventory of diesel, we got on on surface we got diesel loaders, and we obviously had trucks, and then the trucks started getting supersized, and you need huge machines, you know, huge engines to operate these trucks and machines, and and they obviously have to generate a lot of power to carry all that weight from A to B. Um, and so people were looking at, well, you know, how do we get around the diesel thing back in, you know, 1960, 1970, 1980? There's the old crisis and, in there as well, so, right? Yeah. And so, so people were like, you know, so people went over to electric power. It's a lot cheaper than diesel power as was. And, well, up until recently, <laughs> uh, I'm wondering now whether electric power is getting more expensive, like thinking about what's happening in Europe. But that aside... Okay, if you assume just, you know, electric power is a lot cheaper than diesel per kilowatt, it's also more easily transferable through cable rather than through uh, mechanical drives. Uh, I, you know, one, one, one thing that did take catch on was uh, putting electric wheel motors into big open pit dump trucks. Okay. Uh, and so you have a one megawatt motor sitting in the wheel. Uh, and that's being driven by a diesel generator on the truck or an engine driving a generator, which then powers the, and then as the truck goes down the ramp, that mm -hmm. uh, power supposedly can, well, can go in normally, well, historically it's always gone into a heat sink, okay, um, and is lost. But if you have a trolley line system and you have a pent pentagraph that goes up to connect to it like an electric locomotive, uh, as it tracks down, 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 going down the hill, uh, you know, you can put that power back into the grid. And that power can reduce some of your power costs with another truck coming up under a full load on the grid. Okay. And when the truck's connected to the grid, on a trolley line, you know, it's uh, the engine, the diesel engine is just idling. So it's virtually consuming no diesel 
and you've got grid power going into the truck, which is great. So as soon as you go off that line, which you need to do, you know, it's not possible to have lines all the way to where the machines are getting loaded to final dumping point because they, those positions are always moving. Um, uh, but on the main trunk route, if that trunk route is stable for a couple of years, you can put in a trolley line and reduce your cost like that. And that was done at Palapura, for example, it's a big copper mine uh, in South Africa. In When I was a kid, I remember looking at, okay, my dad. And uh, so it's not new. Now we see battery technology coming and everyone's all excited about that. But, you know, I'm all for saving money and going green, but it needs to make business sense and it needs to be sensible. And like, Simple Neil, if I can jump in, like, that, yeah. is the technology yeah. actually strong enough? Like, I know we're hauling 400 tons up a hill at an incline. Like, are the batteries actually strong enough? Like, and, and how long do they yeah, last? Yeah, you can do like, it. I mean, right? the, uh, there's guys investing into this. You know, Cat's now looking at an all-battery machine. I think most of the most of the truck or big uh, manufacturers are looking at this because they have been forced to, okay? Um, but I know Cat's built one. And, uh, you know, there's another truck operating in at uh, Anglo Platinum's mine in South Africa as well right now. It's a, a hydrogen hydrogen combo battery, okay? Um, I think we've got some ways to go be, to get the technology to where we need it. And it's the same reason why you don't see any 18-wheeler trucks running on batteries across the U.S., okay? Like, think of how many, how many materials can get transported by road in the US, everything gets transferred. So why isn't there a battery truck for uh, for those? Because there's no battery that can go the distance and keep going for as long as it needs to go to get the necessary efficiency out. And and it's the it's all about moving the mass. It's the same problem in, in, in the mining yeah. industry. Okay. So if it's small, it works really well. Okay. So for many years we've been using battery locomotives underground, for example. Um, but that's okay because you can get one battery off, put another battery on, and those batteries are relatively small and manageable. Okay, you're only moving maybe 50 tons of material on a rail, which is much less, you know, rolling resistance than a road does. Okay, uh, you know, the rubber tire, rubber tire vehicle is much less uh, rolling resistance on a rail than road tire. It's uh, it makes it makes sense to do that, right? And, you know, when the other thing people don't think about is with these big open pit trucks is they're damn expensive to buy and operate, okay? And it's all about scale. You don't have the scale, you don't get the unit cost down, right? So you go and buy a $3 million truck, okay? You expect that truck to move maybe two to three million tons a year, okay? Um, that means it needs to be, it's your conveyor belt. If that conveyor belt stops, your production stops, okay? So you need that conveyor belt to run all the time or off as much as practically possible. But typically you have an availability issue, mechanical availability. You have to maintain the machine. So that goes down and, and a rule of thumb would be probably 87 to 93% of a 24-hour period is spent on that. And then you have the utilization aspect, which is, you know, when you're sh changing shifts, when the truck driver has to get off, when they're doing a blast in the pit, they have to pull the truck out. Um, that also impacts, and that's a rule of thumb there is about 83 to 85%, okay? So you multiply those two together, okay? And you get the overall operational effectiveness of the machine. And if you're doing really well, you're doing 17 to 19 hours, maybe 20 hours would be really good, okay? So you need a battery that can run 20 hours a day under load most of the time, or at least 50% of the time, uh, given that halfway, you know, you're driving full one loaded and empty the other way. Um, and and uh, to move the, the masses that we're talking about, and it's just not there, it's just not there. Yeah. Now, interesting. So that's the sad fact. Yeah, I know. I was looking into the Ford F-150 Lightning, right? That was attracting a lot of attention as yeah. well. And uh, it came to me when I was traveling with a travel trailer through northern BC, like Banff, Jasper, and all those beautiful places. And I, I saw one Tesla, right? And it made sense, like the, the cars and even the F-150 Lightning, I think the towing range is 30 miles. Nobody goes camping within 30 miles, for example. 
right? Mm-hmm. So that made me think, like, how do you apply it? Like in, in our world, and I'm sure there's scenarios and solutions. I think Elon Musk just tweeted that one of their semi trucks just completed a test drive over 500 miles, pulling yeah. 18,000 pounds or something like that. I forgot the exact number. I actually just tweeted today or yesterday. Can't remember, right? Uh, th- that's hugely interesting. Like, but as you said, like for me, interesting like, as a yeah, I'm sure yeah. it was. Like for me, the IRR and the yeah. benefits, but also need to make sense. You're running an existing operation. Like, are there any? improvements you you would be looking at right now with an existing operations versus a new one because if you're new you can probably like it's probably easier to adapt new technology than sort of yeah. put new technology into an old existing operation right absolutely i mean in terms of technology i mean so you know with trackless mining it seems to be the way to go everyone loves it um uh, because it's very efficient you can move a lot of volume at the ground okay uh, and so everyone by default goes to that. Um, I think having said that, it's still the same old thing. It's draw blasts, uh, you know, clean it out, clean out the development in, and then support. So you've got to go through that cyclical process. Um, and unless you uh, look at, you know, really think outside the box, and it's sometimes good to do this, you know, like people talk about brain mining, you know, you draw two holes. No. You frack the holes and you pump brine on the one side and suck up, and it dissolves whatever you want, and it sucks out uh, your metal on the other side. Conceptually, it sounds brilliant, but practically it's really hard to do. <laughs> We've seen how fracking doesn't work, but not as well as everybody thought it was going to work, I guess. Okay. That's my perception. It might be wrong. But uh, it's, uh, you know, there's challenges to it and there's, there's downsides to it. Uh, especially when it comes to underground mining, unfortunately, you you're a bit. It's back to good old tunneling, you know? and so you've got to go, you've got to go down, and you've got to go in to get to where you want to go, get to the ore body, and then you can mine that ore body. So, and then it's all about geometry, okay? Uh, and there, there hasn't been a lot of change. I would say in the last 25, 30 years, things have got much better in terms of remote control technology. So we, for example, use remote controlled uh, scoops on the ground where we, you know, we have a long open stoke that we're blasting into. Uh, we don't want people to go into there because it's dangerous. You get coming down falls of ground. And so we send a scoop in there to go and load. The remote control pulls out and then it loads a, it loads a truck. So that's something that's been around a while. Um, what I've seen more recently, what we've done with great success is micro-sized Scoops. So we're using a scoop that's only 1.4 meters wide, 1.6 meters high. Right? So okay, yeah, I think 140 yeah. is the narrowest I've heard. Yeah, and we're we're getting into the old part of the mine where they were using narrow. You know, the tunnels are only two meters wide. Okay, two by two, and we're getting in there and we're mining with great success. A lot of old pillars that we're able to pull out with the remote control technology on these little scoops. Okay, that you wouldn't have been able to get out any other way. Okay, and so 15% of our production is high grade from these old part of the mine. And we've been doing that now for four years, kind of crazy, but, uh, and we've still got probably another four years of it to go, maybe more, uh, which is really amazing. Okay, uh, if you think about it. Um, so that's something that I'm quite proud of what we've done here. But elsewhere, you know, there's been, I'm just trying to think of a couple of things. You know, where you have a mining method like a block cave, in particular, where uh, I don't know if you know block caving, you've got miner, it's a large ore body, only suitable for ore bodies that are bigger than 100 meters in diameter, typically. Um, uh, so, like a big copper mine, uh, you know, I would imagine, uh, like, like well, most of the big copper mines, when they go underground, they go into a block cave type arrangement, okay, uh, like uh, El Teniente, like, like Chukikamata. Like Grasberg, they all got block caves. And so what they do is they go in underneath, and they develop a grid of tunnels uh, with draw points, and then they do an undercut and they literally slice the bottom of the whole body off chunk and then let it collapse on its own way. And you get huge boulders initially, and then as it as it, as the whole thing starts to cave, literally induced cave, the there's a lot of abrasion taking place between the rocks and they kind of grind themselves up. So initially the production rates kind of slow, 
do a lot of secondary blasting, but as it goes, it starts to degrade itself, like mill itself, if you like. And you're pulling out at the bottom the whole time with scoops and doing a bit of drilling of big rocks as you go. Uh, that's a very, very cheap mining method. And it's been made even cheaper with automatic technology. So now you have guys sitting in an air-conditioned office on surface operating a scoop on a remote control. Uh, and you go, you can go fully autonomous because that, that scoop always goes to the same point in the draw point and goes to the same tipping point in the ground. So it can be automated. Okay. And they're looking at the surface side, you know, looking at automated trucks, autonomous trucks now, uh, you know, Trucks that drive themselves, kind of like a Tesla, <laughs> I guess. Okay. And those are great. Uh, I guess you're dropping your costs in a number of ways. You're taking out the human error part of it, but you're also taking a human off the wheel. And, and so really, uh, there's a downside to that too in a country where you're trying to create jobs. Okay. You don't really want to do that in Honduras, for example. Uh, because people in Honduras are pretty hungry. They need work. Okay. And they don't have, they can't go and relax. You know, they don't, you know, they don't have, they don't have the support structures that you get in a first world country. Right? So those guys have to do something to eat. So you're taking away a well paying job by going autonomous here in Honduras. I don't think that would necessarily be the right thing to do. Interesting. Yeah. That's an interesting ESG debate as well because the E is taking away from the S, I guess. Right. So, yeah. But it makes a lot of sense in Australia where there's not enough people. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, so, now, that's probably yeah. a topic for a whole other debate there, Neil. Um, yeah. you, you also put out a lot of content, like great content on Twitter. And I, I do have to ask, Thanks. like it's very educational. And I urge everybody to follow Neil, obviously, on Twitter. It's, I think Neil R. Ringdahl, or there's an extra that's letter. Neil right? Ringdahl. Just Neil Ringdahl. Okay, I thought but I saw an extra letter in there right. earlier. Okay. <laughs> but to, yes. why do you put that on there? Like, what, what's your motivation to put that on there? Because it's highly educational. Um, I'm passionate about mining, I guess. Uh, always joking, you talk about the romance of mining, okay? <laughs> um, but uh, I, I do love it. Uh, I think it's a really great career. I'm kind of saddened that everyone's so anti-mining. Um, well, that's the, that's the perception, right? Uh, Mining is a, you know, I always say whatever, whatever you live in or use, if it's if it's not been grown, has been mined. Okay, so your cup has been mined. Your, uh, you know, this these these computers that we operate and work on have been mined. Buildings we live in have been mined. You know, everything comes from mining. Uh, you know, so you can't do without it. It's a people business, and. And I, I'm hoping to inspire young people to, you know, try a career in it because there's sadly very few people uh, taking an interest. Everyone wants to become an IT professional or get into, uh, you know, get a job with Meta. Okay. How would you and, convince and, your daughter and, Neil, to get into mining? <laughs> um, I didn't really do much convincing. I just, you know, she was, you know, lucky enough to come out to mines and mines with me. Guess like yeah, uh, and then you know what I always say to young people: if you want to earn a six-figure salary, you know, within five years of graduating, then uh, or maybe even less, then mining is the one to do. If you like people, then mining's for you. If you like technical stuff, doing, uh, you know, then mining's for you. If you like, if you like me, you like breaking things and blowing stuff up, then mining is <laughs> a great thing to do. You know, and you get paid. For it. It's 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 it's. Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, it's, it can be a lot of fun. Um, and I guess she saw that right now. She doesn't see doesn't see it so much because she's at start at the bottom of the food chain having got a degree, you know. And that's where it's hard, you know. Uh, I think about the 82 guys who started with me when I started studying mining engineering. Only 15 of us got through in four years. Okay, about five to 10K in subsequent years. And of that 15, I think half are still in mining. Okay, uh, which is quite high. It's higher than most, but but that's because it's really tough when you get that start and you you know it's hard work. You got to sweat it, and and but everyone wants to you know rather you know mine or by remote control on their uh, on their computers on their laptops. You know, yeah. use leapfrog and, and and 
uh, all these fancy mind planning packages, which are really great, but but uh, uh, they don't, you know, that's not what mining is about. And unfortunately, we're seeing it in more and more. You know, you've got less and less people who know what they're doing in mining, making more and more technical mistakes. Well, the ESG side is going great, you know. <laughs> so, talking yeah. about technical mistakes, last question, Neil. Uh, you post yeah. a lot of memes as well, or funny photos of my, or funny photos of accidents and funny commentary. Yeah. Any of them from El Mochito? Uh, a couple of them have been, I think. Um, I try and keep the ones, you know, that there's obviously serious incidents, and I try and look at the lighthearted side of it too, because it is human error, and you know, it's, it's a certain, there's a kind of a sad, I guess, satire to it. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's satire, but 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 no, you've got you know people me. make fun of everything and and uh, so when you see what people do, the silly pe- things people do, uh, you know, put it, I like to put it out there. I mean, I often put it out there when we do safety uh, at our operation. You know, we often talk safety is really really important, and everyone talks safety, but it's a culture, okay, and. And, you know, people, if they don't think about what they're doing, uh, you know, you get into trouble, just like you do driving a car it's in the street, okay? And, um, it's the same in mining. It can be very safe. But when things go wrong in mining, it's often spectacularly wrong, okay? And unfortunately, uh, people like it, okay? Um, not always, but it's a high-risk environment if you're not focusing on safety, okay? Absolutely. Um, and so I put it out there for two reasons. One, one to have a bit of a laugh, but also for people to think about what can go wrong. Okay. So. Fantastic. Neil, fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for sharing like so, so much about the challenges, opportunities as well in mining. Really appreciate your time. I think you got to go and uh, run a mine, right? <laughs> fantastic. And uh, everybody fine. follow Neil, Neil, at Neil Ringdahl, super educational. Uh, so pl- please make give him a follow. He has more followers than me by eight times, I think. So fantastic. So, uh, I'm working my way up. It's, it's it takes a while. <laughs> fantastic, yeah, Neil. Thank you so much. Your time is highly appreciated. Really, thank you so much for all the content you put out, and to everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in. This was SF Live. We're on the road. We're in London, UK right now, and uh, we'll be back with lots more content. So make sure to follow, subscribe, and uh, leave a comment. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you, and we'll talk very soon. Thank you.